Okay, now we're going to start looking at organic chemistry, which is the study of the chemistry of carbon. Um, there's a few things that are important to understand to really delve into organic chemistry. The most important thing to get our heads around right at the start is how do we represent organic molecules. Um, we're also going to need to know how to show how re reactions occur between organic molecules. And we do that using mechanism arrows that we call either curved or curly arrows. Um, if you've got a copy of Blackman, the textbook Chemistry by Blackman, then those two things are covered in section 2.2 very early on in the textbook. Um, we're going to also look at nucleophiles and electrophiles. So let nucleophiles are species that are electron rich. And electrophiles are species electron poor. And there's obviously some overlap here with the concepts of Lewis acids and Lewis bases, but um, the uh, differences are, are there, but quite subtle. And we're also going to really need to understand the concept of functional groups. So organic molecules, we want to talk about particular parts of those molecules being functional groups so that we have alcohols, we have amines, we have carboxylic acids, and those functional groups imbue some kind of particular properties on those molecules that is inherent to the functional group itself. And we can do a lot around that knowledge. Okay, so um, I guess at the start of any topic, it's really nice to be able to look at wh where's the history of this, where's the origins of organic chemistry. Really, it dates right back to the 1700s. Um, I guess the thinking for many uh, thousands of, probably hundreds of, th even thousands of years was that organic compounds were um, the kind of compounds that were originally obtained from plants and animals and living creatures. Um, they were difficult to isolate, difficult to purify. They were quite different to, say, smelting an ore and getting an, uh, a, a metal out of it or, uh, you know, dealing with rocks and things like that. So it was thought that there was some kind of vital force that imbued organic molecules with special properties. And this vital force was particular only to organic molecules because they came from these living uh, creatures, these living sources. Uh, one of the first uh, sort of distinctions to be made was, was by Torben Bergman in 1770, who distinguished between organic and inorganic chemistry. And, and that's where this term vital force uh, comes from. Um, because of this vital force, it was thought that organic compounds couldn't actually be synthesized in a the lab. They had to be made within a living organism. Um, but that, that kind of approach, that kind of thought really sort of began to break down over time. So by the early 1800s, there were some experiments that were pointing out that this wasn't really the case. So a very early experiment, and something that had been done for a long time, but was really, um, I guess, sort of captured by... Uh, Chivril, um, was that you could prepare soap from an animal fat plus an alkali. So um, we can get um, an animal fat, saponify it with sodium hydroxide and water, and we get soap plus glycerin. And then you can uh, hydrolyze soap with acid and get fatty acids, which were, um, you know, sort of going back to what was being extracted from living creatures. And so we were going from Sort of organic to inorganic to organic again um, but probably the biggest experiment that really put aside this idea of the vital force argument was by Wuller. Um, so there was a compound available term called ammonium cyanate and this was really thought to be an inorganic compound it was no vital uh, vital force to it um, but uh, he was able to heat um, ammonium cyanate and from that reaction, isolate urea. And obviously, urea is from urine of animals. And uh, so there was an organic compound that was thought to have a vital force. And it shouldn't have been possible to make that organic compound in the lab from an inorganic uh, compound. Now, urea is probably not what we think of as a, a particularly organic, organic molecule these days. It only has one carbon, uh, but it's from an animal. And um, so that sort of, uh, you know, put some doubt on this idea of the vital force. Uh, there's a few um, little side notes here. We've got some pictures of the key players here. And just as a little side note to, on the saponification of, um, of uh, animal fats to make soaps, uh, I don't know whether you recognize this picture or maybe even this one, but this is uh, Margaret Thatcher, very famous uh, prime minister of Great Britain. Um, 
very famous during the Cold War era um, uh, with Russia and um, alongside um, uh, other leaders, um, very important during that time period. Um, she actually has a, a background in chemistry, and one of uh, her contributions was a paper about saponification of um, a particular um, a fat in a monolayers. And so she's a published organic uh, or organic and physical chemist. Um, so what makes organic chemistry so special? Like I guess that sort of ties into what is special about carbon. Uh, well. You know, it is special. 90% or more of the 30 million compounds that are currently known uh, contain carbon. Um, and if you look at carbon on the periodic table, um, it's in this top row here. So there's other elements in that row that uh, bond to carbon uh, very regularly. Um, one of the things that's special about carbon is that because it's a group 4 element, it has four valence electrons and really likes to form four covalent bonds. And that ability to form four covalent bonds gives it a lot of flexibility in the kinds of structures that it can make. And so, you know, here's an example of paracetamol. It's got um, eight different carbon atoms bonded to hydrogens, nitrogens, oxygens to make a particular structure that when it gets into your body can interact with um, biological targets within your body and cause a reduction of inflammation and pain. Um, <clears throat> So most biological molecules are based on carbon. Not all, but most. Um, here's a few more examples. So uh, morphine is from uh, poppies. So there's vast uh, areas of poppies that are grown in Tasmania, and they're grown for medicinal purposes to get uh, from the poppies to get the compound morphine and other opioids, and then to convert uh, morphine and these opioids into other uh, pain-relieving medications. Uh, unfortunately, morphine can also be uh, synthetically uh, transformed into heroin, the diacetate heroin over here. And um, when, it, when it was first done in the late 19th century, of course, they didn't know that it had the uh, very strong addictive properties and the very, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, narrow therapeutic window and all these uh, bad side effects. And so heroin was actually a drug that was available for use to uh, treat pain and other conditions. Um, and it was only later on in the 20th century that it um, got banned and um, and became um, regulated, its uh, use and supply. And of course, opium and uh, morphine and uh, opioids have been the subject of all sorts of um, uh, controversy, wars, um, uh, and it pre present in all sorts of um, historical literature. Things like the opium dens um, are very famous in... Um, some literature from uh, that time period. Um, there's other, there's many other uh, carbon-bearing uh, organic compounds that are of interest. So there's uh, compounds called natural products. So natural products are molecules that are made by uh, plants or animals. Um, and not only natural products are what we call secondary metabolites. So they're not made for the survival of the organism. They're not like making proteins or DNA that are absolutely vital to the survival, but have some kind of uh, extra purpose. So they may be produced by a plant or a marine sponge to prevent um, predators from feeding upon it, um, or maybe made by a particular uh, insect uh, to uh, draw other insects toward it to show where there's food. Um, so here's an example of an Australian uh, natural product called Castanospermin. Um, it's from this particular plant here, Castanospermin Aust Australia. Um, that's uh, also known as a modern bay chestnut or black bean. Um, it was isolated in the 1980s and uh, over a period of years, it was subsequently shown to uh, inhibit glycosidase, which is an enzyme that is involved in the hydrolysis of certain sugar-containing compounds. But um, after that, 1987 was found to be an antiretroviral agent. So it actually inhibits um, HIV. And that's the structure of uh, castanospermin uh, there. Castanospermin, I should say. Um, organic chemistry also has a, a real role to play in drug design, and what we call um, a rational drug design. So this is where we have 
a biological target such as a protein, and we're going to find a drug that will bind to that target and have an effect on a disease. And one of those diseases that is uh, tied in with Griffiths University is influenza. So influenza is a virus, and uh, this virus has many different uh, proteins that are involved in its life cycle. One of those is um, a uh, glycosidase. So um, this gentleman here is Professor Mark von Einstein. He's um, actually a graduate of Griffith University at the Nathan campus. He uh, was one of the first graduates of the Bachelor of Science degree here um, at Griffith University. And, uh, but now he's the director of the Glycomics Institute at the Gold Coast campus. So the Glycomics Institute look into all sorts of aspects of, um, gly um, of uh, sugars in biology and chemistry. One of the major successes that uh, Professor Mark von Einstein has had is uh, he was part of a team that developed the very first uh, anti-influenza uh, drug that targets uh, one of these proteins that's involved in the life cycle of the virus. So that drug uh, was uh, marketed as, or still marketed as Relenza, and it's used uh, still to this day to, case, uh, to treat severe cases of influenza. Uh, it's taken um, as a, um, it's through an in inhalation delivery. Um, and uh, you, you might have heard of um, a Tamiflu, which is very similar structure developed by a different company, and that's sold as a tablet form. So both those drugs are used and could be very important if there's uh, influenza breakouts in the, in the near future.